Let's talk about hunting, Eric. Let's talk about uh <laughs> Yeah, enough of the social media yeah, crap. Enough yeah, of this. Enough of this. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to depress everybody talking about this yeah, stuff. Jeez. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some positive stuff. <laughs> Welcome to the Hunt Back Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. This podcast and the gear that we produce at Exo Mountain Gear share the same purpose to make you a more capable, confident, and successful backcountry hunter. Straight to the point, no fluff, and no BS. This show is all about providing you with valuable information from experienced hunters. To learn more about the podcast or about our backcountry hunting packs, please visit exomountaingear.com. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Our guest is Eric Van Workham from Muley Freak. If you guys aren't familiar with Muley Freak, you certainly need to check them out. They produce some awesome products and lifestyle gear, as well as films and a great podcast themselves. Eric is one of the co-founders of Muley Freak and is quite the hunting freak himself. As you'll hear about in this episode, he had more than a dozen tags this past fall. We talk specifically about a crazy DIY adventure that he went on to Sitka, Alaska to chase blacktail. Before we dive into that hunt, we talk a bit about social media, both the good and the bad, from both a personal and professional perspective. So if you're out there and you're building a brand or you're part of a company or you're just one of the individuals who's into social media, you'll certainly be interested in what we have to say along those lines. As well, if you guys are on the fence about all this social stuff, kind of wonder what it's about, I'm sure you'll find some value from the information as well. So be sure to tune into this episode, not only for that, but to hear about Eric's adventures this past season, as well as what he's still learning. Before we dive into the show with Eric, I want to give a big shout out to Kay Becker. He left us a review in iTunes that we really appreciate, and we want to send him some Exomon Gear swag to say thank you. Listeners, if you want to enter into these giveaways, it's real simple. Just leave us your review in iTunes or wherever else you might be listening to this. And you can also contact us by email by just sending a message to podcast at exomongear.com with any questions, comments, or suggestions you have. As always, guys, we really do thank you for listening and thank you for your feedback. Hope you enjoy this show with Eric Van Workham from Muley Freak. Well, cool, Eric. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we were just joking a bit before uh, before we hit record here about babies in the background. Steve and Eric, you guys both have the newborns at home. My my youngest is five, so I'm kind of past those days. But man, it feels like it wasn't long ago when I was juggling that whole deal. <laughs> oh man, I could probably call Steve every other week and vent to him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the old yeah. dad, the old new dad support group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, my wife's hair done tonight, and I'm on my own here. So, <laughs> so uh, on your own with two kids at home, plus trying to record a podcast, you're a pretty brave man. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. So, so for listeners who aren't aware, uh, I'd love to get uh, some personal uh, background with you. It's, you know, some hunting background as well as kind of your involvement in the industry. If you can just kind of dive into that. Yeah, absolutely. So a little bit of background about me. I grew up on a dairy farm in northern Utah, started uh, milking cows around the age of five. Uh, my family is heavily involved with uh, baseball, football, basketball, and then, you know, hunting. So between the farm, hunting, and athletics, I mean, that's what we grew up doing. Uh, from, you know, bird hunting to big game hunting, hunting horseback. I mean, honestly, the the whole backpacking hunting thing is a little bit uh it's newer to me, like last 10 years new. Like I said, we, we grew up on uh, kind of hunting horseback. So we've been born and raised in a family of hunters. So, um, yeah, so kind of always been hunting. And then a little bit more background about, you know, four and a half years ago, I started a, you know, a marketing slash hunting brand called Muley Freak. And uh, things kind of took off from there and kind of, I always kind of wanted to be in the hunting space and, uh, kind of wedged my way in there, forced my way in there. And now, you know, I'm, I'm here to stay, I guess. <laughs> Certainly <laughs> judging by, uh, what Muriel Freak has been up to, I'd say you're here to stay. I'm curious, 
you guys have a lot going on in terms of, uh, you know, as you mentioned, marketing and products, uh, apparel. You guys are doing video and podcast. I mean, you guys have a ton going on. What does it look like today compared to what you were thought you were getting into four and a half years ago? That's a great question. I mean, social media has evolved so much. I mean, you used to be able to just put a post up there, a giveaway, and uh, get a thousand likes or ten thousand likes, and it, it was easy. Honestly, social media in the beginning was easy. I'm like, this is stupid. This is stupid that you can sit behind your computer, generate this kind of engagement, reach this many people. And then I think the platforms, platforms being Facebook and Instagram, kind of got flooded. They got flooded with people. I mean, no offense to anyone else that's out there and does this, but I mean, all of a sudden there was a hundred, hundred different t-shirt hunting t-shirt companies the next day. And it's just like, wow, everyone's doing a giveaway. Wow. Everyone's giving away a gun because they can get 10,000 likes. Like this is insane. So, so Facebook kind of changed some things. Be, be, they wanted to deliver a better customer experience. So they, they wanted people to users. Okay. So they wanted users to see content that they really wanted to see. So they did this algorithm change and it basically weeded out the players from the real players. So those people that were starting up t-shirt companies because it was a cool thing to do kind of went away and disappeared because it's, it's gotten a lot harder. So it's, it's evolved a ton. I, and I, and I think they made it that way. So like Facebook and Instagram could get more users initially. And then they had to, they had to say, okay, now, now it's time to weed out the people who aren't for real. So. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes sense and hopefully, you know, the users and listeners can follow that. But I mean, it used to be easy. I mean, to get 10,000 likes on your company page, you used to do, you used to be able to do that without spending a dime in ad, in ad dollars or ad spend, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a, there's a higher barrier to entry. Um, yeah, I, you know, social media is something we want to talk about in the show and I guess let's, let's attack it. You know, there's two different perspectives. Um, one being, you know, as a brand and things like that. And I'd love to continue to, to go down that path a bit. And then we'll obviously get into a bit of like just the person, just the everyday listener and kind of social media and how that affects their hunting. But let's, let's hold on to that one for a second and get back to the brands because there's, you know, whether it's guys selling t-shirts, it's guys, you know, making videos, it's guys with a product. I mean, there's all kinds of people looking to make an impact on social media for, some sort of business reason, whether they're a business owner or just kind of want it, want to become an influence, if you will. So, you know, as you mentioned, it's changed a lot. What are some of the things you are looking at today? And what are some of the recommendations you have for guys who are looking to maybe, you know, maybe they have some films and they're looking to partner with a brand like Mealy Freak? Or, or XO or, you know. Right. Yeah. Any of the above. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, let, let's go back a little bit. About three, four, five years ago, it was almost astonishing to me, like the bigger brands, how they had not embraced social media. Um, like the Brownings, for example, I, in my opinion, Browning still hasn't embraced social media and they, and they have that big of a brand. And, and how do you know this? Well, go look, look at their page and look at how many likes they have as a brand on the page and then look how much engagement they're getting on the page. And I used to make these phone calls to these companies and, you know, I was just like the little, the little kid knocking on the door trying to get in. But it was so funny how many, many of them didn't take social media serious. And you look at the small companies, you look at companies who, who have grown exponentially on social media, the Mealy Freak, the Mountain Ops and the Cryptex. And I'm, I'm sure I'm missing others here, but, but companies that didn't have a rich history to go off of and a hundred years of branding and how they've been able to blow up as a result of social media, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. It, 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 was, it was just crazy how, how, how it took you know, brands so long to kind of embrace that. And it's become a powerful tool if used correctly, and it's, it can become a powerful tool. So. But then as, as far as it's effect, um, affected individual users, I mean, look, look at all the people out there trying to build their little Instagram handles, you know? Every, everyone's seeking a sponsorship. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can't tell you how many emails I get. That literally, the, the only thing is, hey, I have you know ten thousand Instagram followers. You should send me a free pack. And I'm like, like, per, like I just 
don't care how many followers you have, right? I mean, it's like, what type of person are you and, and how do you hunt right. and what are you doing? You know, it's just, right. it's how so funny how, and... yeah, not, yeah, it's not even about success either to me. It's just, it's about being a good person and, and not posting dumb stuff or I don't know. Um, right. It's just interesting though, that people expect to get free stuff just because they have yeah. followers. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had a, a canned message I used to send out uh, back when Obama, Obama was in administration and say, hey, Obama gives stuff out for free. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> and it would make me so mad. People just want free stuff. Right. Well, that's funny. You got At least you got people with 10,000 followers. Some of mine have like 100 to 500. <laughs> <laughs> like you want free stuff, huh? We'll go, yeah. we'll go get a job and come back and buy some stuff. You know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what was Mark? We had the best one ever was some gal messaged us on a Saturday. Oh and was yeah. Interested in getting a pack. And then like Monday morning at 9 a.m. She messages back and says, uh, well, like something about, well, thanks for nothing. The least you could have right. done is respond. <laughs> like there had literally was... <laughs> been like two business hours before the, she like yeah. responded and was, yeah, all, PO'd. And, and then uh and then you responded something about you know hey sorry it's only been two business hours into the day and she's like well i'm used to companies responding immediately even on the weekends or something like that and it was just oh wow it's yeah. just the it blows me away that the yeah. i don't know the, well the funny thing is too is it's like i mean i called a guy on saturday because he he emailed me with some pack questions and i didn't get a chance to call him on friday afternoon so i called him on saturday so it's like if you have a legitimate you know business need i don't even mind giving you a call on saturday but if you're just a girl with eyelashes looking for some free stuff like i'm not going to get back to you on a saturday yeah uh, oh my gosh funny. yeah there's there's lots of those yeah but, yeah i mean you got people in in my opinion that are just out there for free stuff and aren't really being true to who they are you know mm -hmm. some of them aren't even hunters or don't have a i mean it's it's great if you're a first time hunter but i mean come on man you're going to hunt this fall because you just want free stuff and you do other stuff and to get followers and whether it's taking selfies in your swimsuit or bra or whatever and i mean Jeez. <laughs> so give us some, I mean, as you kind of mentioned, so, you know, you go back five years ago and it was easier to get likes. It was easier to get engagement. It was easier to build a presence. What about the guys who are getting into the game now, or maybe they've been in the game a bit, but they're, you know, having trouble making traction. And I'm talking specifically about the guys that are actually doing something good. Like give us some tips on the guys who are doing yeah. something legit, who, you know, legitimately kind of deserve to have a following who are doing the right things who have good content kind of give them some tips on maybe some ways they can increase engagement or grow their audience yeah absolutely so i did i just got back from a three-day social media marketing conference in san diego and the, and the biggest thing that i kept hearing over and over again is be authentic deliver deliver content that's unique and be yourself people love you're different from anyone else. Steve's different from anyone else. Mark's different from everyone else. Eric's different from everyone else. So if you can deliver a message and customer experience showing how you're unique and you're different, people just love that. That's why you have YouTubers being so successful right now. It's just being mm -hmm. unique. And, you know, as far as brands that maybe haven't embraced social media but want to now, you got to – Instagram is still a platform where you can generate engagement and followers organically. So it's an, it's an easier platform to grow. Now, Facebook, on the other hand, you got to pay to play. <laughs> and a lot of people say, and I, I've had this conversation with Steve. Steve's like, or not, not necessarily Steve hasn't said this, but people told me, you know, Facebook's dead. Well, it's not dead. It's the most powerful tool out there if you know how to use it effectively. And that's yeah. budgets and spend and ads. Yeah, we joke that SNS Archery when they changed their al algorithm that we got like blacklisted on Facebook because we could we'd post something and it'd get like ten people would see it, you know, and it'd go yeah. from the week prior, you know, you'd have a couple hundred likes and whatever, um, and then it just yeah. completely shut down overnight. It was it was pretty yeah, crazy. it's crazy. And, yeah. and Facebook wants you to be active, so 
if you can get a couple posts in a row where you do good, mm-hmm. then it will. I it's this like momentum. is a, yeah, yep. It's it's an un, this is an unofficial term, but I call it a reach score. So if you can get more likes on a post and kind of get yourself buzzing, then the next post will do better and better and better and better. So for example, if if we're trying to link people off of Facebook, the platform itself, and send people over to the website or YouTube or somewhere else. Facebook knows that. And so they'll kind of they'll kind of crunch down and choke it. Well, now if you all of a sudden post an engaging photo of a giant buck or a, you know, a big mountain lion, you'll notice, holy crap, we just got 8,000 likes and reach a quarter of a million people on that post. So mm. Facebook's no dummy. They, they, they want you to be active. They want you to be calculated with it. And they want you to play their game. And it doesn't mean always having to spend money. Like you can still reach people organically on uh, Facebook. If you look at, you know, look at Muley Freak, we try to be an example of that. You know, we had a post just kill it a couple of days ago with Mount Lion. But, um, you know, sometimes we get that though. It's like all of a sudden you get 20 likes. You're like, what the hell? Is it really that bad? Mm-hmm. And, and it's not. It's just how it's kind of set up. And you just kind of, it's a, we call it a daily battle. It's a daily battle to try to, you know, get your engagement going so you can be seen. Yeah. Have you noticed, Eric, that Facebook tends to uh, tends to favor video these days? Because it's something you know I'm seeing in terms of engagement and reach that video is doing better than photos, for example. Yeah, f- video um, video is big right now. Um, Facebook projected last year that they would overtake YouTube in views, and I believe they did that. Really? They o- they overtook YouTube in overall views. Wow. Now, Facebook calculates views a little bit different. They don't calculate when a, a user necessarily views the whole video. They yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm sure if you go to minutes yeah. watch that YouTube would crush them, but maybe, yeah, yeah like YouTube initial would still, plays. Yeah, YouTube would still beat them. Yeah. I, I, I would guess, but, I mean, it makes it, yeah. it's they're, they're investing heavily in the video side of things. And they're, they're playing with a function now where, you know how when you scroll through a video on your Facebook feed, it's silent. You you can't hear it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're they're going to be rolling out where the sound is automatically playing. Goodness. Oh, that would drive yeah. me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So certain users will see that here over the next few weeks, where you'll be scrolling through your newsfeed and you'll just hear sound playing. You won't actually have to click on the video to hear it. It will just be playing as you scroll. Huh. The sound. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, if, if, if brands can incorporate some video, which we all know how video, it's not easy to get lights, get mics set up, right? Get yeah, a camera. it's work. I mean, for it's, sure. it's work. But you know, to the brands that do a good job at it, like for example, Steve at EXO, he does a great job with his review videos. You know, uh, they like that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So let's let's transition for away from you know maybe some of the business side, but still stick with stick with social media and just talk about hunters and social media and kind of what it's done in the industry again not from a business perspective but just looking at the good and the bad um you know the fun and the ugly because i think i don't i don't know it it seems like hunting such a unique little niche industry and it seems like social media has such a a big impact and has really really changed things so what are you seeing in terms of how social media has affected the hunting industry, like more on the personal level? More on the personal level. Um, gosh, I, I think it's, I think it's just absolutely changed it in, in leaps and bounds. Um, I mean, I mean the amount of people that you can, one individual can influence and, a, a regular guy can all of a sudden be just this, I, I don't know what to say this, just this almost like this public figure mm-hmm. and brand brand. And they call it influencer marketing brands, uh, leveraging, you know, these people who have followings, uh, and being able to do effective marketing. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, some, some of the good of it, it's good for brands. I mean, if, if you go out there and you, I mean, you take someone like Travis Nowotny, okay? Travis has around 10,000 followers. He doesn't have 100,000. He probably should with who he is as a person and a hunter. 
but the amount of people he's able to reach and influence for brands just with 10,000 followers is, is amazing. Mm. Be- you, you get those, r- just some of that raw talent and Travis is a quieter guy. He's, he's humble, but you get someone with that raw talent. How, how many people, especially younger crowds. So take Instagram, for example, there's a, there's a little bit of a younger crowd that's on, um, more than millennials are moving to the Instagram and the Snapchat. And the amount of people that some people like, you know, Travis, for example, can influence there is, it's crazy. How, otherwise, how, if social media didn't exist, how, how would, uh, how would you touch so many people? I guess you could do print, but you know how long it takes print. You know how long it takes grinding to get your product in the dealers. It's amazing what you can do with digital marketing and, you know, and that includes email, but, and social media. And, and then, I mean, then you get the ugly. I mean, you take, uh, you take, and I'm going to mention names here. You're going to take that, that poor elk magnet kid who killed the two, uh, German shepherds. Mm. I mean, you guys heard that story, I assume. Yeah. 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 Maybe I mean, give the quick two minute version for listeners who haven't, but yeah. Okay. So, so quick two minute version. And I just, heard it i didn't really get that involved because i don't have time to get involved in that kind of drama but supposedly this kid has gotten into trouble with the law before poaching in utah blah 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 uh he you know he, he wants to be insta famous you know guys want to hold up that big shed that big buck and sometimes it's ruined people because kids adults will break the law just so they can try to become successful and look good on social media if that makes sense so he's up there shed hunting he sees two dogs quote unquote roll up all over the hill and he kills them both well he walks up there and everyone can see their two what look like domesticated german shepherds and he he's he claims they're wolves because they're up in the mountains they're wolves and so and he stuck with it like guys ripping him guys are saying hey those aren't wolves dude he stuck with it he's like no these are wolves they, they smell like wolves they ran like wolves and they're in the mountains so they must be wolves <laughs> and they were smoking like German wolf. shepherds, dude. This guy smoked two German shepherds, and and I don't know the exact facts on this part, but supposedly there's like a dog farm in the valley somewhere there. So, oh, I mean, geez. just destroyed a guy like him, you know. And you know, mm. you take that, you take that into the high country guy in Wyoming who was pretending like he was doing these Frank Church wilderness hunts, and he was killing high fence bulls. Yeah. And he, and he was exposed. So the pressure that social media can cause or, you know, emit on some people is, is bad too. Yeah. I mean, social, you do bad things with tool, good things with guns and bad things with guns, you know? Yeah, for (laughs) sure. I mean, social media certainly didn't, uh, didn't invent poaching. It didn't invent, you know, uh, unethical means of hunting, but certainly the, as you said, the pressure or really just the desire to want to make a name for yourself or to, as you said, be insta famous is, is only unfortunately increased that for guys who, you know, who don't have the ethics to stand behind, you know, proper hunting. Right. Right. And there's, there's guys just out there killing, hunting and killing just so they can get a post out. It's not because that's what they wanted or that's what they actually love to do. And that seems absolutely ridiculous, but they're doing certain things just to get attention. Mm -hmm. Which, in in my opinion, that's the wrong, that's for the wrong reasons. Right. Yeah. Talk to that, Steve, because, you know, whether that's your experience and, and what you have built as a brand or what you guys have done with Pure Elevation or just the interactions that you've had with people wanting to sort of get in the industry or whatever. I mean, talk to the fact that I think a, so many people don't know really what they're getting into or what they're asking for when they're trying to break into the industry, break into the business, have a brand, etc. Oh yeah, that's a tough one. Um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of best way to answer that. I mean, I think, a, just be genuine. I mean, I think that's uh, if someone approaches me looking for something uh, and I go look at their Facebook or Instagram feed, that's what I'm looking for is just, you know, just a genuine, honest person. And I really don't care, you know, how many followers you have or whatever. I want somebody representing, you know, whether it's XO or SNS, you know, in, in a good way. Um, and then 
I get really turned off by, you know, for lack of a better term, like product whores, guys that are just like constantly pushing stuff. And then one day it's this supplement company and the next day it's the next supplement company. And Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. That one's, that, that really turns me off. Um, you know, so just, uh, just like, again, just be genuine and, and, and like Eric saying, do it for what you, you know, the, the reason you're doing this stuff is because you love it and you want to get into the hunting market more. Um, but as far as that, you know, I think it's so many guys come and go because there's, there's not like a lot of, there's no money there in the, in the real big picture of it. You know, you might get a free, you know, bow or a free site or something like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like, <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of that. I think that's part of the reason why with Pure Elevation, we kind of stopped filming the last few years, just take a break from, um, from the pressure of, of, you know, having to feel like you need to perform or get something on, you know, get a kill shot on film, you know, and you just want to go back and get to enjoying stuff a little bit more. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more there. I mean, I had 13 tags last year and I filled nine of the 13 tags and it got to the point where it got pretty stressful for me. Right. I'm like, Oh, well yeah. I've spent this on this out of state tag. I, I got to freaking try to kill it. And I was going with no sleep. Wasn't seeing my family. And I'm just like, well, I, I got to make this happen, you know? And I'm just like, Oh man, I'm stressed out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At the, at the end of the day, you kind of look back and go, man, was that, was that worth it? You know, all that sacrifice to, to take away from maybe a quality of life. So, exactly. um, it's a good point, Steve. Yeah. And then I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I blame a lot of companies for, for treating some of these people, the influencers, Eric, that you talk about is, is like they're worth, um, just based off of their followers, I guess, you know, oh, they gosh, you shouldn't, yeah. You should not be able to get anything for free just because of how many people are following you. Um, right. And uh, and it is crazy the power that they do have and they do influence people. And I think some people in that position need to um, understand that and be maybe a little bit more, I don't know, respectful of um, just everything that's going on. Um, right. and, and yeah, it's a tough. I don't know. I'm a I. I battle with social media and in, in my personal life, you're not going to see me posting a whole lot. Basically, if I do something, it's, it's hunting or business related. And, um, you know, I, cause at the end of the day, if I'm home with my daughter, I just want to play with her and I'm not too worried about throwing a photo up on Instagram of, of me and her right. playing, you know, it's just, just about being with her. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I respect that and agree with that. I mean, I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to vlog about my life. Right. I mean, I, I don't know how some of those people, make their lives that personal. I mean, even when right. I go on a vacation, sometimes I won't check in cause I'm like, I don't want people to know I'm gone. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I do the same thing, you know? So yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think in my opinion in the hunting industry and I won't mention names here, but I mean, I think there, I think there were some monsters created as far as giving yes. these influencers that type of authority. Yep. And yeah. that's as far as I'll go into that. And I'll let you, I'll let the listeners kind of imagine what I mean there, but I mean, they created a monster. So yeah, I agree. Cool. That's yeah. It's, it's interesting all around. I mean, it, it just going back to what you said, Eric, it's a tool that can be used for good. It can be used for bad. I think, you know, the big takeaway is, you know, is to be authentic. It's something that's been said multiple times and whether that's, you know, you're a brand or whether you got guys and you're making hunting films and you're trying to get out there, or whether you're just Joe Schmo, like don't get caught up in trying to be something that you're not or project, you know, a profile when it doesn't really match your person. Right. Um, at yeah. the end of the day, this stuff is, it's, you know, it's not a big deal. <laughs> right. it's, yeah, it's, so yeah. many people are treating it like it's such a big deal and in the end of the oh, day yeah, it's not yeah. a big deal and, and it's funny because hunting's not the i don't know about you guys but hunting's not the only thing i love yeah oh yeah i, totally I like to it. travel i like foreign languages i like culture i you know i'm a religious guy and i'm sure you guys i know i don't know you very well yet mark but i know steve likes to bike he likes to train i mean and you look at some of these profiles you would think that the only thing they love to do is hunt we want to take a minute to thank Easton Archery for sponsoring this episode. I've bounced around from arrow company to arrow company. 
I started with Easton when I very first started shooting my bow, and then dove and bounced around, and then finally came back to Easton, and haven't changed since. There's just something about the arrows. I just have so much confidence when I shoot them. But not only that, the more I've learned about Easton and their processes, their details, their engineering, it gives me even more confidence knowing what's in the product. If you guys haven't heard episode 66, I highly encourage you to go check that out to learn more about Easton Archery and their arrows. I was fortunate enough to kill my bull elk last year with an Easton FMJ that passed right through and had great performance, and I can't wait to do it again this fall. Let's talk about hunting, Eric. Let's talk about the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, enough of the social media yeah, crap. Enough yeah, enough of this. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to depress everybody talking about this yeah, stuff. Jeez. Yeah. Let's talk about some positive stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hear about a hunt. You just mentioned you had, what, 13, 14 tags this past year? Yeah, it was uh, it was a little too crazy. <laughs> so yeah, I, don't, about, I don't recommend that. Sometimes. Yeah, let's talk about one of those hunts and break it down and uh, the blacktail hunt that you got to go on. So give us the high level of that, and then let's kind of dive into some of the details. Okay, cool. So I have I have a couple buddies, and they are Alaskan Hawaiians. So they live in uh, Hawaii six months out of the year, and they live in Alaska the other six months out of the That's year. That's brilliant. Solid. I've never heard of yeah. this. Smart, huh? Yeah. So they're in the fishing industry in Alaska. And so when the fishing season's done, they head over to Hawaii. Uh, one of them was born in Hawaii, the other was born in Alaska, but most of them live the majority of their lives in Hawaii, but they, they're about six months, six months, or eight months, six months now. So anyway, my buddy calls me up. He's like, hey, dude, do you want to come with this mountain goat hunt? I'm like, no, I just can't get away for time. Like, I really want to do, you know, deer is a passion of mine, obviously, and Muley Freak. And I'm like, yeah, I really want to do a sick of black tail hunt or Kodiak or whatever. He's like, yeah, dude, well, let me call some buddies and let me know. Well, I hadn't heard from him. I wake up the next morning. I get a text from him. And he goes, or, or, or before I went to bed that night, he asked me for my date of birth and stuff. I'm like, what's going on? He's going to send me a birthday card. <laughs> I, and I, I wake up the next morning and he goes, oh, I booked your ticket. I'm like, book my ticket for what? He goes, oh, to sick Alaska, we're going black to hunting. I'm like, what? I'm like, okay. I'm like, okay, I'm in. So I took off that Thursday, and neither of us, neither of us had hunted uh, sick of blacktail. We had no idea what we were doing, but he had a friend from high school that moved to a sick Alaska that had a commercial fishing boat, and he had a little skiff that we could cruise around the ocean on and go venture islands and try to find and figure out what we we're doing so we we went to the local so we get there we go to the local grocery store and we buy a, a deer call and we jump in this 15 foot bathtub of a skiff and we we head out in the freezing cold uh, rain and where we just start hitting islands looked on map looked on on x maps and hit islands and just started deer hunting really it was crazy that's nuts so not, none of us had ever really done it before. You'd never been up to the area for other hunts or anything? Either? Uh-uh, okay. Never. Wow. And I never met his other friend. And his other friend, he's a commercial fisherman. He's not necessarily a hunter. But he kind of asked some locals because I guess it's kind of a big thing there. But um, yeah, he kind of asked some locals. So we got some tips. And we all just couldn't believe that we we're going to blow on this deer call and, and bucks were going to come in. Like we, <laughs> we couldn't believe it. So it was like a grunt call? No, it's like a squeal. It sounds like a little piglet's getting raped. I mean, <laughs> Almost like a distress it's, call. Yeah, it's it's an awful sound. And so we'd we'd go through we'd hike through this country called Muskeg, and it was really um, and, and Steve, you probably know what Muskeg is, right? It's really swampy and oh, yeah. sink, and there's like these sinkholes, and we just get to these little spots where we could actually see, and. Uh, yeah, we just squill on this call and, and, uh, first, first call, first day, first outing in runs a freaking buck, like coming at you like kamikazes, hmm. just running in full speed, running at you. And you just, it's almost like you can't even believe it. It's, <laughs> it, it's, but we, we, to, we did time it perfect though. We went in the peak of the rut. So we did have that going for us because. Apparently, there's only about two, three weeks out of the year where you can actually call those in, those yeah. black tails and like that. And when was this that you were up there for the peak? Um, first of November. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. First of November. 
So right before they dropped their antlers too. So it was perfect timing. Wow. And you know, we only, we only saw six bucks the whole trip. So it wasn't like we went in there and every call stand we called stuff in. I mean, it was, it was tough hunting, but the quality of deer that we were able to hunt and kill, um, and we had the locals shocked, like with the pitchers and bucks we were bringing home. It was, and I have one of the mine that's at the taxidermist right now, but, um, it was it was pretty crazy, pretty crazy. Mm. So so you jump on this skiff every day, and you're you're traveling the ocean, and there's just literally hundreds of islands, and you just kind of pick these islands, and these deer swim the ocean, so they can even be on the smallest of islands. No way. You, it, yeah, you just seriously. You park, wow. Yeah, you 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 literally hundreds of islands, and you we just would anchor the boat. And we kick it off. We kick it away from the shore because the the tides are really crazy there. I mean, you could be stranded there for 14, 15 hours. So you have to read the tides because you could anchor in a spot and not be able to get your boat out. You'd be, I mean, you'd be, you'd be stuck <laughs> because the tides can go out. So we had to read the tides and then we had to Johnny rig stuff and kick the boat out and toss it out as far as we could and then pull the anchor. I mean, we had some pretty, uh, some pretty unconventional, unconventional methods that, but we didn't know what we were doing. We were just trying to, and luckily I will say to the, the listeners, I would never go do this hunt on your own. And granted we, us three, we'd never really hunted this, but my two buddies, they know the ocean very well. They grew up on the ocean their whole lives. And if, if you fall in that water, especially that time of year, you have literally minutes before you're dead. So, and and there's a lot of tides and whirlpools and currents coming in. So there were, I mean, there were times where we could have flipped and, and there's been ships lost in certain channels because it'll just suck ships in like big ships just under the water. And so it's, it's not something you want to do if you don't know what you're doing. I, I would recommend if you were going to go out and do a DIY hunt like this, you at least hire a boat driver to kind of take you around hmm. you're, you're not there, going to rent a boat you just don't know enough we don't we're, we're land people those alaskans especially that live on those coastal towns dude they're tough they, and they know the ocean yeah i think there's some larger islands too though where you could kind of get dropped off and spend you know four or five six days hunting right yeah i think there's some bigger ones we didn't go to anything like that okay i'm uh, just th- I, I was thinking like i don't want who, listeners like, to hear that and- yeah. yeah, that there's like no DIY opportunity in the area because I think there's some, but probably not obviously with the method yeah, of, of bumping not, around that you guys are. Not any of the stuff I probably did. I think we could have probably got dropped off on some of the bigger islands and hunted for several days for sure. Okay. But so there was bigger land masses that we could have hunt, but and we were there for only three, four days. So we didn't have time to really sit on one place and see if there was stuff there. I mean, I guess if a guy had a little bit more time, and did a little bit more research than we did, I think you could probably stay stationary on one of the bigger land masses mm-hmm. and be just fine. So the, the second to the last day, we actually we went 40 miles one way on this little skiff, which seemed like a, an eternity because the ocean was rough and we had to go through some rough channels. Literally, um, you're standing... Okay, so I, for, for people that don't know what a skiff is, it's basically has a podium with a, a aluminum rod around it. And you're basically holding on standing up. So you're riding 40 miles across the ocean, standing up, holding on to this aluminum rod. Cause when you're skipping across the ocean, you're just, you know how it is when a boat will jump and you're just trying to hold on for dear life. <laughs> so it sounds like a perfect old. scenario for lightning too. No, <laughs> if I come in this aluminum boat, holding on to a pole. <laughs> yeah. It was crazy. And then you're trying not to hit driftwood. You're trying not to hit sea otters and seals. And there's humpbacks all over the bay. And you, you know, you're trying not to do anything that's going to flip your little, your little skiff. But anyway, so that one day, the second to last day, we were going 40 miles. We're like, hey, we're going farther. So that was absolutely torture for me. For these guys, it was nothing. So you know, it's it rain. It's constantly raining there. So when the rain's hitting you on the face when you're going 30 knots, it hurts. So you just you close, you kind of close your eyes, double up on your rain gear because you're going to get soaking wet and it, and it stings when it hits you. So we went 40, 
40 miles that one day. We found this island. We're like, hell, man, this looks sweet. So apparently the salmon run was pretty weak that year. So the brown bears hadn't gone to sleep yet. And apparently we're hurting pretty bad for food. I guess they're in the town of Sitka. It's, I guess there's only 11 to 13 miles of road in the in, entire city of Sitka, and that's it. So it's not a very big town. And I guess there was a bear chasing a guy on bicycle, a bicycle while he had his headphones in running, and the bears were supposed to be sleeping. So there was this, there was this big thing about the bears not sleeping. So every time we went into these muskegs blowing on this call, we were looking behind us, in front of us, to the side of us, making sure – that um, a bear wasn't coming in on us. And literally those, it was so easy for those bears to be silent because that muskeg is so soft and so squishy in their pad. They have such a big pad. You wouldn't really see them coming. And literally daily we were tripping over bear crap. It was everywhere. Everywhere you looked, everywhere you stepped, there was brown bear crap and it was all fresh. Wow. So, so back. Yeah. It, go ahead. Spooky. Steve. I was going to say, it's got to be spooky. (laughs) Oh, especially for, you know, a Utah kid who's never seen a grizzly or brown bear, you know? Right. So did you have any, did you have any encounters? Oh yeah. So actually on this last day, so the 40 miler, we get there, you know, we, we knew the tide was going to be bad that day. So we, we tossed the boat way out, pulled the anchor, like, Hey, tied it back up. We're like, this is going to do. So we head in there and we're seeing uh, fish carcasses all over. And nothing real fresh because you could tell that the salmon run ended a while ago. So we're in there blowing, blowing. We're going through that devil's clove and all this nasty stuff. And we're finding musk eggs and tons of musk eggs. Ton- it, and it was getting to the point where it's getting pretty deep. So it was hard to navigate through it. Finally, we got to this, this one and we, we called in rips this nice bug. So we're trying to get my buddy a buck because he hadn't shot one yet. And it was a nice buck, especially by sick of standards. So we ki- he he finally hits this buck. We kill him. Um, we I got a buddy, um, Kama, who's there. He's he's in he hunts a lot of axis deer in Hawaii. He he can literally bone a deer in two minutes. He's that quick. He he kills a lot of a lot of axis deer on the island. So he's we bone this thing up pretty quick. We throw it in all our packs and we go on. So we hit the next musk gig. Like, oh, dude, this is the best one yet. So he starts, we start ripping on those call. We all taking turns. We had two or three of them. All of us had a little bit different sound. And we don't know how often to blow or when to wait or what kind of pitch or, or anything. And, and about 80 to 100 yards, we didn't even hear him. I spotted him first. These, these guys didn't even see him. 80 to 100 yards comes in this, in, in my mind, giant brown bear. And and he circles, stands up on two feet, and is just trying to wind. You could see him flipping his nose and head in the air as he was trying to wind and locate where this sound was coming from. So he spun, winded us, and was kind of coming at us. And and luckily these two um, had uh, brown bear tags because they're they're residents, and they had their locking tags and everything with them. And I threw my gun up and I said, you guys better shoot because I'm not letting him get much closer. And <laughs> he, he, he put one, he put one right behind, right behind the shoulder and the bear just starts screaming. Just, I don't know, like you see on Disney, like, you know, when those bears will make those sounds on like the Disney cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounded like. So this thing falls down in one of those huge musk egg sinkholes. And just literally trying to fight not to drown, but it was still alive. So we're there, like look, like we're just in disbelief. Like we couldn't believe what had happened. So he shot twice, and the second time he missed, and he shot this bear right in the face, like right through the snout. So this, so we get up there. That bear's still alive. He's like squirming in that musk egg. He's he's trying to get at us and. Finally, we put another one in him, and we have pictures of him like in this sinkhole. He was just now we have to now we have to pull a eight nine hundred pound brown bear out of this musk egg. So it took all three of us to kind of pull him out of there. But it was it was it was almost unbelievable. Like that <laughs> that he came he came in to one of our our calls. Yeah, and we hadn't wow. seen a brown bear the whole time. And supposedly on Sitka, there's no there's no black bear. It's not like Prince of Wales. There's there's zero black bear 
on Sitka and the, and the surrounding islands that kind of go with it. Just and for whatever reason, I don't know, but they have they have these big dark chocolate red brown bears. So and that, and I didn't know that. I don't know if maybe one of you two knew that, but I didn't know that. I didn't either. That's crazy. No moose, no moose just Sitka blacktail and brown bear. That's all they have for mammals, I, I believe. That's it. Huh. How far no. do those deer swim? Like they swim like a mile across the ocean, or just like a couple hundred yards? I, someone told me they can swim up to 50 miles and they've seen some go even farther. What? Yeah. <laughs> it seems crazy. insane. That's, That's crazy. Insane. <laughs> I, I would think that the killer whales sometimes have their way with them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But wow. I, there was a, there was this dead stinking rotting um, humpback whale in the bay that was, was on the shore and mm. we got to see it's like jawbone and like ri- it was in dude alaska is insane <laughs> you know especially yeah. like that coastal alaska life mm-hmm. they're so dependent on the ocean it's, it's crazy man anyway so we we skinned that bear out and that hide alone was a, i think 104 pounds when we got back to my buddy's place wow so did all you guys end up tagging out on this trip then, on deer? Yeah, yeah. We killed uh, we killed six deer total. Wow. One, one. Well, three really nice bucks and one giant by sickest standards. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's totally. Different. We kind of rough taped him out around. Um, I think it was either 116 or 118. Really? Yeah, and I I think I think I want to say books like around 12 or 112 or 114. I'll have to look. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking anything in the triple digits is pretty dang solid. Yeah. Or maybe it was 108 this book. I don't don't know. For guys that have never, I don't know, hunted Sitka blacktails in the rut to be that successful and have that kind of experience. I mean, man, I was pretty, I was pretty tickled, you know? Yeah. Hmm. It sounds like an awesome trip. Yeah. But 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 to your point, Mark, I think if a guy found one of those bigger islands, he could spend a few days on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because, I mean, Alaska, you know, and for blacktail, that's not one of the tags where you are required to have a guide or be with a resident, you know, because, like, you know, you talk right. like sheep or whatever, and, and, you know, those are incredibly difficult to get. But I think it's pretty easy as a non-resident to, to get the blacktail um, opportunity. And then I think if you can, you know, it's, it's travel and, and maybe get a boat ride to one of the larger islands where you can just be, Hey, drop me off for five days. And I think if you go that route, you know, it's a pretty affordable Alaskan hunt. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, tags aren't really expensive. You obviously have your airfare and meals and you got to have some really good equipment. Um, what, yeah, what, a lot of- I was going to ask you what our standouts gear wise, um, just from hunting coastal Alaska. I mean, it's so different than the demands of, you know, what you're used to hunting at home or really in most of the lower 48 for sure. I mean, luckily I had really good equipment. So I, you know, I had, I doubled up on rain gear, wore gaiters and had those waterproof La Sportiva boots. But honestly, those guys hunted in fishing waders and extra tough fishing boots. And they stayed drier than me, and they were way more comfortable. But again, this is a different this is a different type of hunt because we weren't in the high alpine, right? Right. Yeah. We were in November. The deer weren't on their way to the shore, so we hunted in a time that they were transitioning from the high country, the high alpine, down to the shore. But they weren't on the beach yet. We weren't hunting these on the beach. We had to go in and find these in the swamps. Because apparently they run on the, in the swamps and then they come to the beach during the winter to eat the kelp. Okay. And the stuff that's washed up. So if you hunt them early season, which I have not done, then you'll find them in the high alpine stuff. That's where you see guys taking pictures and bows and you mm-hmm. know, velvet bucks up there. But this, you don't hear, at least I don't, and maybe I just don't get out or talk to very many people, but you don't hear a lot of people doing the sick of black or the, the blacktail hunt 
on Sika, it's more on Prince of Wales and Kodiak, hmm. which Sika, in my opinion, is a totally different hunt than um, the Kodiak and the Prince of Wales. Okay. So, and again, the time of year totally changed our hunting style. We were blowing on a call and we were hunting the swamps. They, they weren't in the high country anymore and they weren't on the beach yet. But if you want to hunt those things in December, they're all over the beach. You don't, you, you park your boat and you get on the beach and then you go shoot them. It, that's, <laughs> and that's what the locals like to do. Locals, from what I learned, they don't go in there and hike after them. They do not do that. They're like, there's ways your deal to, ki- to kill, and we'll wait till they're on the beach. They don't. They don't even really hunt them, kind of during that time because they don't. I mean, they're locals. They they're used to kind of you know being right. yeah. spoon fed a little bit, and they can go whenever they want. So they'll just go shoot them from the beach. And you cannot. It's illegal to shoot them from the boat on the beach. You have to actually get on the beach and pull the trigger, but. Well, I think we only saw one doe the whole time on the beach. Everything else we had to hunt. And like I said, we only saw six or seven deer total, six, and we, you know, six bucks. So hmm. it's funny because you could, there's probably, you know, you could have a listener thinking, oh, he's full of, he's full of crap. There's no way. <laughs> it depends on the time of year and exactly where you're at. And you have to switch yeah. your hunting style and tactics. Oh, yeah. But, yes. you know, and, and, my, and back to the DIY thing, I mean, I don't know how to navigate the ocean. Right. You know, I, I, I haven't learned the currents and the moon, and um, I'm not really that handy with a boat. And those those Alaskan guys, I mean, they're 40 miles out. They know how to rig up and fix the boat if something's not working, you mm-hmm. know, which I don't have that much experience. It's just not really um, something I'd want to do on my own. I would hire – even if you want to do a DIY, hire someone to, you know, drive you out. Yeah. To at least drop you on the island. Yeah. At least drop you on the island and, and know, and at least have somewhat of an understanding of the tides. So number one, you don't lose all your gear. And number two, you're not wet and miserable the whole time. And you know, your stuff doesn't get wet. Can't light a fire, you know? Yeah. Right. Wow. But one of, one of the coolest hunts I've ever done. Totally, totally different. Yeah, yeah, just like so it. so so outside the realm of hunting mule deer in Utah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so so outside the realm of mule deer in Utah. <laughs> but if I did it again, I'd take my bow. Yeah, because we were calling. We didn't know what to expect. None of us knew what to expect. We we'd never done it, but we were calling those things in sometimes to, I don't know, forty to ninety yards. Hmm. And we got so impatient, we probably could have called them sooner, but we were already pulling the trigger. Yeah. <laughs> we were just too excited. We we couldn't believe it was working. <laughs> so, you know, it'd probably be pretty fun. pretty cool to even bow hunt that in November because you could probably, kind of like an elk, but they don't scream. They just come in silent. Yeah. Huh. Huh. So do you have any, uh, speaking of uh, cool hunts, anything planned for 2017 or at least confirmed? Or are you still waiting on draws and things like that? Um, you know, I think I'm pretty much set. I have, uh, an antelope tag, a lot of mule deer hunts, and I've been saving my pennies for a few years. I actually have a doll sheep and grizzly nice. hunt. There's a grizzly around, so nice. I'm actually, I'm actually pretty excited about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah As bet. you should be. Yeah. So where are you <laughs> headed for that? Um, I believe the, I think it's the, I think we're going to go the Brooks range. Brooks. Okay. For the doll sheep. Yeah. Dang. Dude, so, that's cool. You know, what, I made a what, goal. Go ahead. What time of year do you do that? Um, I'm going to August, uh, middle of August. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So, like, so, do you have, like, 10 days to hunt, or what's that looking like time, time-wise? time uh, Six days. Six days. So, you know, I don't I don't hunt without outfitters hardly ever. Um, most of my stuff is just kind of over-the-counter DIY stuff, but most, most of you know that um, you got to have an outfitter to do. Right. Sheep. So six days he typically has he is as long as he uh does. Um it hmm. won't be a bow hunt. Uh it's gonna be a rifle hunt. But um should be pretty fun. I figured, you know, do it now. There's a fi- there's a thousand dollar to fifteen hundred dollar creep um every year, so it's only getting more expensive. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's like, man, well, been saving for a minute and I'm gonna try to make this happen. 
Yeah. It's awesome. Making little payments here and there, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. good, man. So what's uh what's in store for Muley Freak? You guys like I we mentioned in the in the podcast uh, at the beginning of this show, there's so much you guys have going on. What can you tell us? Where should we follow you? What where can we just stay up to date and everything you guys are doing? Um yeah, great question. I think we're going to continue to develop the brand. Um on top of that, continue to come out with a few specialty products. Um we just launched a a, a we call it the Stealth Binocular Harness that um we feel like is a pretty sweet little binocular harness. So we'll, we'll come out with a, like I said, just a few specialty products. And you know, the thing that I really love and that we do really well is boutique social media marketing, aligning ourselves with certain brands and really getting dirty on doing some cool things on the social marketing. And so keep seeing more of that. And then the films, I mean, I learned last year that hunting that much, um, can be pretty taxing I'm not I'm not only the hunter but the family also so I've kind of leveraged I've reached out and recruited a few solid solid hunters to help me out with films so we're going to keep coming up with our films because we're in the woods we figure we might as well film it and keep making some of our cool lifestyle films yeah that's great man well we appreciate you taking the time to join us it's been good yeah awesome thanks for having me guys it was yeah. fun thanks yeah. for coming on Eric I'll take I'll take you guys to Sitka sometime. <laughs> Let's do <laughs> Let's this. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you guys.